Welcome, Welcome to the meeting of the San Francisco Ethics Commission, January 23rd, 2012. We'll take the roll. Commissioner Sudley? Here. Commissioner Liu? Here. Commissioner Ham? Here. Uh, public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda that are within the jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission. Good afternoon, Commissioner Burr and uh, Commissioners. My name is Patrick Planshaw, and once again, I do not see my agenda item on the agenda. That would be for the Sunshine Task Force referral for enforcement on case number 11013 and 11014, which was sent to you five months ago. You have not yet scheduled a public hearing on my item. Should not take you five months to either recuse Mr. St. Croy from this case, since the task force sent over with a finding of willful failure and official misconduct against Mr. St. Croy on both cases. So for him to recuse himself in this body to schedule a hearing on my case, I'm wondering when you're going to tell me, Commissioner Herr. When you're going to schedule my hearing on the agenda? We'll let we'll you hear it. I'm sorry, I have a hearing loss since birth. I didn't quite catch that. I said thank you for bringing it to my attention. We certainly will look at you. That would be the third time I brought it to your attention, sir.
I think the time has come for this body to recognize that that running exists. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Dr. Allison Washburn. I'm um, the, a member of the Sunshine Ordinance Task Force. I occupy seat number five and was appointed by or recommended by the <coughs> League of Voters of San Francisco. I also chair the Compliance and Amendments Committee of the Sunshine Ordinance Task Force. I appear before you in November at your regular meeting to urge you to meet with us uh, jointly about your proposed regulations for handling sunshine enforcement cases. Um, and I, I, will, I think that the consensus seemed to be from you that it was, that would be a good idea. Um, I then sent a letter, um, it was dated January 6th, um, 2012, asking for, again, for a joint meeting, suggesting the week of February 6th, it's probably too late for that to happen. But I'm here today to, um, again, request a joint meeting. I think that um, the um, matters before us are complicated. Um, the history between our two bodies is strained. Um, we look to the Sunshine Ordinance Task Force and citizens look to you to help enforce the city's uh, public records laws and this hasn't been happening. So I hope to hear a response to my letter in a few days time so that we can schedule a joint meeting. Um, thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you very much for the time clock. And uh, it's a little bit alarming that even though this uh, meeting is relatively sparsely populated, the handouts are already exhausted. Uh, I begin by saying stop the corporate break the public library, don't give money to the Friends and Foundation, don't accept money from the Friends and Foundation. You may remember that this commission at its meeting in July found that the president of the Library Commission had committed a willful violation and her conduct was below the standard for a public official. Later that month, the Library Commission, during the discussion of a, a copier service for the public, one of the commissioners said, and I quote him verbatim, you know last Monday when we had met, the commissioner, commission meets on Thursday, last Monday when we had met, the commissioners had met, we talked about how the changes to the printing system would potentially, potentially impact the staff as well. I was just wondering if it would be worth it to speak to the public about how this impacts the staff as well. You don't have to be a genius to figure out that this is a blatant admission of a non-announced meeting among the commissioners. It goes without saying that there was no announcement of a meeting on a previous Monday and no explanation offered that why this was not uh, a blatantly illegal meeting. I mentioned this several times, of course, my mentions of it were never uh, documented in the Library Commission's minutes. Uh, finally, at a meeting of December 15, that same commissioner said, again, into the microphone, and I transcribed him directly, there is just a thing in reference to an illegal meeting, which was simply a briefing. I just wanted to be clear, there's no such thing as an illegal meeting, it was purely a briefing. Well, this is an example of them simply flaunting their power. They have a commission president who's been found in willful violation. You have no concept of how corrupt these people are. Uh, I certainly found nothing comparable in society. They are ripping off a public institution of millions of dollars. And a finding of being unethical or violating sunshine ordinances and uh, laws is just an opportunity to show how impervious they are and how weak any sort of democracy is compared to the influence of, and the influence of money and corporate power that they possess. <coughs> Uh, the fact of the matter is, if you come to this ethics commission meeting and just shuffle paper, you need to be aware of how much damage you're doing because you're demonstrating 
how powerless democracy is. And of course, the laws cost more than the money. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Dr. Gary Kerr. After 20 years at the Bruno Honda Hospital, I became a whistleblower. And then I was laid off. In the past six years, you've dismissed 29 consecutive Sunshine complaints. Even though you substantiated 20% of them, none resulted in any enforcement action, and only one was granted a public hearing. All of them were dismissed. This wrongly implies that the complaints were not valid. And it also allows city officials who violate the Sunshine Ordinance to claim that they were exonerated by the Ethics Commission. Your handling of whistleblower retaliation complaints is similarly one-sided. Every single retaliation complaint has been dismissed since the Commission was founded. Meanwhile, the Government Accountability Project has provided legal aid to some 5,000 whistleblowers over the past 30 years. Here's what they advise in their whistleblower's survival guide. It says, you will surely suffer retribution for blowing the whistle because bureaucracies instinctively eliminate anything perceived as a threat. Academic studies confirm that more than 90% of whistleblowers report subsequent retaliation and they give references. Now, if experts say that retaliation occurs in 90% of the cases, why do you report a retaliation rate of zero? Please consider two possibilities. Number one, your investigations are biased against complainants. And number two, your decisions are based on opinions from the city attorney, who has a duty to defend the very same city officials that we report for wrongdoing. Thank you very much. Good evening, Commissioners. Dr. Maria Pimero, I was uh, pushed out and forced out of Laguna Honda after 22 years of service to the city. Two years ago, we made three whistleblower complaints to the Ethics Commission. The first one regarded Health Director Mitchell Katz, who was at the time making $10,000 a year <coughs> working for Health Management Associates, a for-profit corporation that had a contract at the very same time with the health department that Dr. Katz was running. This complaint was dismissed by Ethics. Our second complaint regarded Davis John Associates, who was awarded a $2 million Department of Public Health contract. Davis John's wife, a high-level DPH executive, played a major role in awarding him the contract. After two years, the controller revoked John's contract, citing, quote, irregularities, unquote. This complaint was also dismissed by the Ethics Commission. The Laguna Honda Gift Fund was reported as well. It's a charitable trust for poor patients that was being plundered for staff parties and perquisites by the Laguna Honda administration. Nine months later, and a lot of public pressure resulted in a controller's audit that restored $350,000 to the patients of Laguna Honda. But again, this complaint was dismissed by the Ethics Commission. And lastly, I was driven out of Laguna Honda after 22 years, and Dr. Kerr was laid off. Our whistleblower retaliation complaints were dismissed by ethics without a hearing. Is this ethical decision making? Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Peter Warfield, Executive Director of the Users Association. First of all, I uh, want to thank the Ethics Commission today on its inauguration of publicly televised meetings, which will make it much easier for the public to observe what is happening at your meetings uh, compared with audio only. I hope that the Ethics Commission will continue 
uh, progress in the direction of open government by improving in a variety of other ways, and especially by having public hearings on issues referred to you for enforcement by the Sunshine Ordinance Task Force. That's an area where I think you have an unfortunate record. A case that I brought against the public library uh, in 2004 is one of the first that was referred to you uh, that was included in the group that Alan Grossman's lawsuit brought. The issue there was the library's refusal to provide workers' comp records, even redacted, to uh, prevent uh, any kind of confidentiality uh, harm. Records that would confirm or unconfirm their claims about a very important issue, and that was, what are the health risks of barcode swiping for employees? They were claiming that swiping barcodes to demagnetize books when people check them out was causing repetitive stress injuries that were harmful, bad, and so on, and even crippling to employees. We asked for the documentation that would back this up. They refused to provide it. And after a lengthy follow-up process, including their refusal to attend Sunshine Ordinance Task Force meetings, at which specific members of the library staff were requested to attend, the Sunshine Ordinance Task Force referred this matter to you for enforcement. I was unaware of any process whatsoever. I was unaware of any hearing whatsoever. And ultimately found out that a letter had been sent uh, using the phrase, which I don't have before me, dismissing or no violation found, as though the Ethics Commission had actually had some process in place. It was pretty shocking. And I wanted to tell you about the real world consequences of this, uh, which I think is important for you to recognize. This isn't just a piece of paper over here and another piece of law over here, and do they or do they not match up? But there were very significant uh, consequences in the real world that hurt library users. Thank you. Commissioners, Ray Hart, Director of San Francisco Open Government. As documented in a recent civil grand jury report, that this ethics commission has failed to carry out any responsibilities related to the Sunshine Ordinance. Through this failure, the Ethics Commission has sided with the city and against the citizens in every case where public comment was prevented and public records withheld. Not only has this Ethics Commission failed in its duties, it has willfully and knowingly thwarted the efforts of the Sunshine Ordinance Task Force. It has done this for years while misrepresenting its efforts as trying to work with the task force. It has been derelict in its duties in allowing the staff to dispose of every case without a hearing. The members of the Ethics Commission, after taking an oath to support and defend the California and the United States constitutions, has acted in ways that knowingly and willfully violate the constitutional and civil rights of the citizens of San Francisco. Now some may feel that I'm being too harsh in this, but I think the prior speakers and myself have really looked at the records and for the first time, we are now on the public record so that the citizens of this city can actually see what this Ethics Commission has done up until now in the dark. And I will quote Senator Barry Goldwater in his 1964 presidential acceptance speech of the Republican nomination, where he said, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, and moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. You have not done your job as far as sunshine and the citizens of this city. You took an oath to support and defend the Constitution, and yet when citizens come to you and say, we were denied an opportunity at a public meeting to meaningfully comment and participate, you ignore it. You side with the city 100% of the time. Now, it's kind of hard to argue with that record as being one that is totally unjustified. Hi, Commissioner Bruce Kimokoski here. 
First of all, I wanted to uh, congratulate you on having the televised version of this uh, meeting this long for due. I'm glad that uh, you found money in your budget for it. Um, or, um, I wanted to say that I am sad to see uh, the poor record you have today on enforcement of sunshine referrals. Um, almost every one that's been sent to you has been dismissed um, without, without a public hearing and without uh, pretty good regulations uh, in place to dismiss it. Um, I would strongly encourage you to uh, have a joint meeting with Sunshine Task Force to work with them um, on the uh, regulations that are needed to be designed to handle Sunshine uh, matters. And um, I would advocate that you will do um, uh, significant work in protecting the public's right to speech as well as rights to documents and whistleblowers. Good evening, Hal Smith. Uh, I'd like to thank you and congratulate you on starting the televising the, uh, the meetings this evening. It's a great beginning. I congratulate you and thank you once again. Uh, it's good for the citizens of San Francisco. It's, uh, it's good for democracy. It's good for citizenship. It's good for open government. But it's also good for you because it gives you a chance to tell the story of the Ethics Commission. It gives you an opportunity to be out front, strong, noble people, working for the benefit of the citizens of San Francisco. Today, uh, it's my understanding, I have lots of Chinese friends, it's the year of the dragon. Dragons are strong. Dragons are, uh, are wonderful people who believe in the strength and character. Uh, I consider this your beginning. Since you're televising tonight, I guess it's on your birthday. It's the beginning of something. Be strong like dragons. Do the right thing. Protect the citizens of San Francisco. Protect their rights. Protect open government. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Hope Johnson. I'm the chair of the Sunshine Women's Task Force. I'm here to um, uh, reiterate what uh, Dr. Allison Washburn said, the chair of the Compliance and Amendments Committee, to request that you consider having a joint open meeting about the Ethics Commission's regulations on Sunshine. I think that even though the um, ethics staff really disagrees with us, that there are a number of things that you might want to take into consideration. There are um, a number of things that uh, happen within the city that demonstrate that the ethics staff's opinion that it's only willful violations is a little bit misleading and perhaps incorrect because, first of all, the, uh, the Ethics Commission is tasked with collecting up all of the um, signatures stating that the required um, employees and elected officials and public officials have taken sunshine training, so you're clearly involved. And in Section 15102, Rules and Regulations, which is specifically to Ethics Commission, it says, um, in addition, the Commission may adopt rules and regulations relating to carrying out the purposes and provisions of ordinances regarding open meetings and public records. And the individual clauses of the Sunshine Ordinance don't work outside of the law, the other laws, the California Public Records Act and the Brown Act and you're also tasked with upholding those. It's not just individual provisions that you can argue to entangle them or unentangle them, depending on what you do or do not want to do. None of the ethics commissioners, as commissioners, want to rely solely on staff without really investigating it with people who hear them all the time. In addition to the, um, in C369911 under duty is the appendix to section 15100. Uh, it says that one of your duties is to advocate understanding of the charter and city ordinances related to campaign finance, conflicts of interest, lobbying, governmental ethics, and open meetings and public records, and the roles of elected and other public officials. <coughs> city institutions and the city electoral process. And I think the fact that they put open meetings and public records in there 
they're really demonstrating that um, your responsibilities are more than just willful violations. So we would appreciate the opportunity to discuss that with you, um, with the commissioners themselves, rather than going through memoranda from the um, ethics staff. Thank you. Good evening, uh, ethics commissioners. My name is Thomas Piccarello. I'm also a victim of uh, your staff's dismissals of one of the orders of determination by the Staff General Task Force. I, I won't go into the merits of the case. Uh, you, you, you have the records. Um, but the statistics cited by Mr. Grossman and Dr. Kerr are very troubling in terms of the dismissals of all sunshine ordinance, orders of determination. You know, for the members of the public that are watching the proceedings, uh, they should be advised that the sunshine ordinance task force makes a determination when there is a violation of uh, request for public records or not being able to participate in public meetings. Um, the sunshine ordinance then also gives you the responsibility um, to review orders of determination by section on this task force. Um, the statistics uh, by Mr. Grossman and Dr. Kerr um, would support the assertions that the Ethics Commission, at least in the past, has been biased against um, individuals who have shown that the rights have been violated uh, at all the meetings or public records. So my suggestion to you is that you put the matter of enforcement or lack of enforcement of words of determination back on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you to the public for your comments. Uh, Resident.
Marion Clinton.
Commissioners, Ray Hart, Director of San Francisco Open Government. And uh, unfortunately, when I review these things for a meeting, I always have a tendency to read the entire thing, not just the part that's under revision. And having attended the Library Commission meetings for the last couple of years, I happen to uh, read something in here and came to the conclusion what you're doing here is rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Section 5 says prohibition on gifts for assistance with city services. No officer or employee may receive or accept gifts from anyone other than the city for performance of a specific service or act of the officer or employee would be expected to render or perform in the regular course of his or her duties for advice, for advice about the processes of the city directly related to the officers or employees' duties and responsibilities or the processes of the entity they serve. I just recently, in December, had a finding of a sunshine violation against Luis Herrera, the city librarian, for withholding public records. He was very, very careful to send all of my requests to him, to the, the secretary of the library commission, who then sent me all the information from the friends of the San Francisco Public Library. Now, they withheld all of the information which would appear in documents that the city librarian is required to provide to the mayor's office, the comptroller, and other city agencies, and simply gave me the numbers that the friends provided, which are not audited. The interesting thing was, you look at some of the categories, and then you look at this item, Mr. Herrera gets approximately $65,000 a year from the Friends for use at his discretion. $30,000 for public relations, and another thirty-five dollars or thirty-six, dollars depending on which year you're talking about, for use totally at his discretion. So in other words, they give him a nice big fat check, and he buys things like office supplies. I guess the library in the city doesn't provide him with office supplies, so the Friends has to give him $35,000 a year to buy those. And he takes the staff out to lunch, and he has this, and he has that, and he goes to conferences. All of which are related to his duties, but all of which have also, I believe, put him in a position where he withholds information about the Friends and what they actually turn over of the four to five million dollars a year they raise, and what actually makes it into the coffers of the city library. So far in the Branch Library Improvement Program, they committed to a $16 million contribution. So far, they have given $1.4 million, although 88% of the branches are completed. And every time Mr. Herrera has asked for an explanation by the Library Commission, he makes excuses and demurs. Peter Warfield, Library Users Association. Uh, the previous speaker has certainly touched on some issues that are very problematic uh, and which I certainly think you should keep uppermost in mind. Uh, I didn't come particularly to comment on this, but I do think I have some observations to make for your consideration. First of all, the library typically does not buy books from publishers. They buy them from essentially from jobbers like Baker and Taylor, who provide a whole ton of books from a whole variety of publishers so that they can deal with one vendor and, by and large, don't have to deal with the many, many, many publishers that exist. If they have a problem with a particular title, they could easily go to a bookstore or a jobber and get it that way uh, without having uh, a direct connection with a publisher. The elements that you appear to want to cross out from Section 3A, restrictions that apply to all officers and employees, seem to me, me to be somewhat problematic as well. Uh, and in fact, number D, as in dog, seems to me to be insufficiently uh, restrictive even as it stands it should be much broader. It says no employee, of the city or the, no employee or the city librarian may serve, whether compensated or not, as a consultant, exhibition designer, or preparator for a company, nonprofit organization, artist or artist collective, whose exhibitions are booked into the library. Well, I think that the final phrase ought to be stricken altogether, and that 
D should stand. They shouldn't be serving anybody who has a relationship with the library, particularly where there's money involved, as, for example, the Friends. It shouldn't just be for the folks who have an exhibition. Section E, as in Edward, following that, talks about no employer of the city library may be employed or buy or provide services in exchange for compensation as an instructor for any person or entity that provides training at a library. Well, there's no reason why an employee should be an instructor for a, as an example, technology vendor at the library. I think that's a clear potential conflict of interest. So I think that all of these things that you're looking to strike are not really uh, issues, and in specific cases, certainly the library could seek an exemption. Uh, I do think that these are conflicts that are problematic, and in the case of D, should be strengthened rather than weakened. Thank you. Good evening, David Kilpell. A um, couple of items on this, and I recall my testimony uh, back in May when we last discussed this issue. Um, on page one, there's a proposal to add uh, some of the library uh, policies as references. Um, that's fine. I just think it's important that those policies either be um, hyperlinked in the document that's available online or uh, be available on the um, library's website so that they're easily accessible. Uh, and one of the items there, the Library Bill of Rights, it's not clear to me if that's the San Francisco Public Library Bill of Rights or if it's the American Library Association Bill of Rights. It may help to clarify um, just whose Bill of Rights that is. Um, on the pages two and three, the language that's proposed to be uh, stricken as it reads now, I think it would just replace A through E with reserved, and then there's an A that appears again on page three. Uh, next to E, so I'm not sure if it uh, is the staff's intent to have something hanging there or not. Sorry. Um, and on the substance, it does seem to me, even if the general restrictions are proposed to be eliminated so that authors, so that a member of the commission or staff can be a published author in the library can buy their book to circulate, which was part of the intent here that there may be other examples that are embedded in this A through E um, that really do conflict with official duties and should remain even if they repeat and, and codify more specifically with examples, things that uh, would appear from Government Code 1090 or um, other prohibitions such as um, being involved in a contract with an being compensated by a vendor who contracts with the library generally, like the book binding example. So I think that those are continuing prohibitions that exist elsewhere, but this is perhaps the best way to repeat and codify those because those other documents don't have the kinds of examples here that your staff has um, ably and, and nicely crafted to uh, guide the conduct of officers in place. So I would encourage you to keep some of this as we try to eliminate those uh, problematic prohibitions. Thank you. Um, I'm actually here for the next agenda item, the CFRO, and there's no more paperwork um, about what we'll be talking about. Is it possible for staff to get more before that agenda item? Comments with respect to um, This is um, more in the nature of a question, I think, maybe for um, Ms. Ingram or Mr. Shin. Um, we know that there are general uh, conflict policies that apply to all city employees above and beyond the SIAs. And it would help me to understand something about the scope of those, whether they really uh, 
are a more general version of the same kinds of things that are in the sections that are proposed for deletion here, or uh, how do you think they would operate in, effect in situations like Uh, Deputy City Attorney Shen, uh, Andrew Shen. Um, I, they're just different. I think they're they're both broader and broader and narrower. Um, so, for example, one concept of interest law being commission is familiar with is the Political Reform Act, uh, which we also enforce through our local law. Um, in general, that conflict of interest law prohibits um, city employees from participating in a process which affects their financial interests. And one significant difference between that statutory scheme and these restrictions is that at least with the Political Reform Act, you need, be, you need to be part of the decision-making chain before you have a conflict and you're prohibited from participating. So that's one way in which that's different. So these restrictions, as you read them, don't necessarily apply to just those people who are in the decision-making chain. And I think that was where Commissioner Blue's question was going before. These are just much more broad. You don't even need to be part of that process on the Libraries Act um, to have these rules affect you. Um, and I would say that these are also, in some ways, broader. Um, or, or, or it, there's are many other differences, I think. I mean, one way in which they're different, let's say, the political format, is that the, the way to deal with the political format conflict is to recuse yourself from that process. And whereas here, this is a completely different process, you're well aware of about getting advanced work determination, uh, getting that considered by the appropriate decision maker in the department. So it's, it's just different in many respects. Uh, but I would say, in general, they're kind of targeting the same things. Uh, the Political Reform Act does try to prohibit you know, city employees and officials from somehow benefiting themselves, sort of at the end of the day. And I think that's what a lot of the traditions go towards themselves. But it's hard to say they precisely overlap. Uh, but you know, there are ways in which these kinds of concerns are addressed with other existing conflict of interest laws as well. I have another question. Um, it's been a while since we were um, approving a whole series of these SIAs. Um, so I have forgotten whether this was a, a standard as part of it. Clearly, throughout the ethics laws, the notion of appearance is what it looks like to the public for somebody to be involved in uh, multiple activities, even if there is not a formal or absolute chance to influence the decision or specific benefit to the person. Anyone who can help me with this? So it's lots of questions. Um, are appearance issues part of what we are trying to cover through the answer? Um, uh, the answer is no. Um, we're not really dealing with appearances. We're really dealing with those incompatible activities that departments have identified in the society as being incompatible or incompatible with the mission of uh, the department, in this case, the public library. So I, I, um, many of these provisions that we have here um, really are covered by some of the policies that are listed, that are now listed, um, such as the collection policy, exhibition policy. Those really set, set out ways by which certain of these matters are handled certain processes are handled by the library, and therefore, um, I think the library feels that because we have those things in place, and because the provisions as they now stand really prohibit a lot of the employees from doing the things that um, lead to like, greater participation in the community, for instance, and the things that they want the library to library staff members to do that perhaps is not the best that having these provisions in the SIA is not the best thing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, and so my final question is whether the waiver process would suffice or whether there are um, activities or a range of concerns that the library is worried about and things would be problematic. Um, I'm just trying to understand the cost if we were to leave these in place and ask people to seek waivers. Clearly, they could return again if that group cumbersome or they can set the examples. So uh, I'm just wondering if this, we may want to ask Ms. Marion to come back um, 
possibly others have questions for her as well, uh, about whether that is, uh, uh, what the pros and cons would be to uh, letting the library uh, take a little longer with the rules this way and deal with matters case by case if they came up uh, and follow with their needs and provisions. Dealing with the matters case by case, if it's felt that um, if we can just have the rule established, or rather have uh, the SIA indicate um, the position that we could be excused from doing case by case uh, matter, because I believe that the there would be numerous case by case. Um, situations that would be brought forth to the city library and it's my understanding that he wanted to get it established in the SIA. So can you show the answer? Would it be appropriate to ask for example that it would be too intrusive, but I'm just wondering um, what kinds of activities you the library wants people to be able to do. Um, that are covered by this that would be permitted if these were not permitted. Since we're at least hearing from public comment that um, the example of uh, a book and publisher is not, may not be the particular work that you're anticipating. Well, it was, I mean, we, it is, yeah, it's the one that we're anticipating that it was maybe because someone was an author Um, if that if if that is the principal one, then uh, there are several here that don't go to that kind of situation. Um, when those could be left in, or leave them in and see what the experience is. I think the book is almost the most obvious because the book appears in the library with somebody's name on it, and you trace you know, how the the acquisition decision was made, the library commission is not deciding I would imagine one by one was the purchase. Right. So if that's the if that's the issue that you're trying to correct, it seems that possibly dropping all of these is only relative to that If I if I could add, um, when the city librarian contacted us about this, um, there was a suggestion made that um, if we could drop most of these provisions, the provisions that they would not uh, mind staying in are provisions as a uh, sales representative, purchaser, or publicist for a publisher. Those types could stay in. But what they were concerned about was if you had a prohibition against somebody being an author or an editor, that would really have a major impact on development of um, um, library staff. But we can think that we can think about um, going back and perhaps retaining what is like, for instance, what is in B parts of B. Right. Say yeah, if it's right or right. Mm -hmm. I think that would be acceptable to the city of Maryland. What about publicists? Yeah, I, I believe that the publicist was included. Uh, sales representative, publicist, and uh, purchaser. <laughs> So has the city librarian been dealing with this in the meantime with AWD waivers or have there been waiver requests? It's my understanding that there have been some waiver requests. And that the librarian has granted those by then? Yes. Any further questions for Ms. Marianne or comments and commissioners? I guess I would like to see that tailoring, that narrowing. I think there is, some of these seem problematic, but the, 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 the author seems least troubling and most likely to recur. So that, that would be my own. I'd agree. I'd be inclined not to eviscerate the whole 
protection in Georgia, what we need to do to address the primary concern, especially in the AWD waiver process that's been working. I'm not sure we need to just completely eliminate the entire section. Tailor it, I would want to more narrowly tailor it as well. I have no objection to that. I, I, I certainly think um, narrow tailoring is, is appropriate. And to the extent that, Ms. Mary, you're telling us that, that these particular taking out just sales representative, purchaser, and publicist for some of these subsections would still uh, get to the conduct uh, that, that you're concerned with, I think we should make it as narrowly tailored as possible. So, what would be the process then going forward? Um, what we'll do after tonight is meet with library staff again and come back to the commission with new language. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, Commissioner Ham. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, uh, are these provisions then going to apply to commission members as well as employees? That is, is that the that is a proposal. Um, Perhaps we should address that as well, as Commissioner Hand suggested, so, so that we can provide further direction to staff if, if necessary. Um, my view, based on the memos and, and hearing from Ms. Miriam, is that the other uh, regulations governing this process sufficiently protect against uh, the types of abuses that, that we're concerned about, both for employees and for um, uh, commissioners. Okay, I welcome the comments of the commissioner. Well, again, I mean, uh, on SIAs for <coughs> other commissions, um, do they apply to uh, commission members? Uh, commission members being considered officers? Or is it just for employees? It, it really depends on the provision and also the department. So um, there's no, the, so there's no uniformity. There, there is no uniformity. Commission, commission. There is no u uniformity, and if you look at actually the SIA for the library, it's only three A that applies to officers, uh, the officer or employee, maybe employee by the others. The other provisions, B, C, D, E, e apply to the city librarian who is an employee and employees only. So there is a distinction there. And, and in this case, um, because the library commissioners do not engage in contract making, and do not, uh, and it's really the city librarian or other staff who make those decisions on behalf of the library, my inclination is to keep it like that, uh, to have the B to D, if we're B to E, when we're um, narrowing the, the exemption to apply only to employees, and the city librarian. So to just have that one narrow provision apply to uh, the commission members, and the rest of all of, all of this is for employees? Um, the only problem is that for commission members, I don't know that there, that if we got rid of A, because when we're talking about A, we're talking about uh, really there's, the, the commission members are not engaged in making contracts. It really does not apply to commission members anyway. So we're really talking about B to E, in maintaining B to E, but narrowing the exception so that it only applies to um, sales representative, purchaser, or publicist, and that would only apply to employees. Is, is that does that make sense? Anyway, we'll come back with a recommendation. Thank you, Any further comments? Thank you, Mr. Next item on the agenda is uh, consideration of the minutes of CPRO. CPRO would like to make use. Um, this document is, represents an amalgam of um, a lot of the public feedback that we got at each person's meetings, um, the work the staff has done input from the commission at our last meeting and uh, meetings with Supervisor Campos and, him, um, and their staff. And uh, we tried to craft something that um, um, is accessible.
except to one, just the commission, but to um, a majority of the supervisors, the supervisory plans. Um, the elements of this are based in um, both documents produced by ethics and by supervisors campus. And uh, the supervisor campus essentially um, pulled them all together into a proposal um, that maintains the best elements of the funded finance program. Um, and allows us to move forward, uh, but also to accommodate the constitutional restrictions that the McCombs decision by the Supreme Court has placed on us. Um, and uh, uh, having said that, Supervisor Garcia, so see if she wants to add anything to it. Good evening, Supervisor Ken. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Chair, and also thank you to the commissioners. I know that this has been somewhat of a lengthy process that we've been engaging in since the Supreme Court ruling on, on Arizona in, in June. And so we appreciate you considering kind of a variety of different ordinances around public financing so that we can meet uh, the, the, to me, the unfortunate U.S. Supreme Court ruling on public financing, um, really addressing the trigger of disimbursement of public funds um, in response to independent expenditures. Because um, as the board has stated, um, they believe that it substantially burdens and independent expenditures on First Amendment rights um, to speech. And unfortunately, arguments around leveling the playing field um, and encouraging the usage of public financing, which I think is viewed amongst many federal voters as, as kind of eliminating corruption and also increasing a candidate's ability to spend time with voters and engaging on important issues were not viewed as compelling state interests justifying the uh, restrictions on, on First Amendment speech. Uh, Mr. St. Croix kind of alluded to some of the aspects of the ordinance that was brought before you. Um, what came from our office, um, at least, was, of course, raising the ceilings to really be what was reasonably seen in past elections amongst district elections. Um, in almost every district, we saw that we did have to raise uh, the ceiling in response to kind of the spending that was uh, utilized in each of the races. And I think um, raising it to $250,000 is reasonable, is I think on average what we had seen. It's not the highest of what the ceiling has been raised to. So I think the highest we saw was roughly around $300,000. But you know, really considering that there are 11 districts and kind of a wide variety of what the expenditure is, I, I think $250,000 was a number that we felt comfortable raising it to. Second, of course, most important was taking away the trigger for how we disimburse public funds in response to independent expenditure independent expenditure is directly in response to the Supreme Court ruling. Um, second was raising the qualifications to, um, to apply for public financing, raising it from 5000 to 7500 I understand that the Ethics Commission is interested in raising it to $10,000, and we are comfortable with that. And I think many of my colleagues are comfortable with raising it to that amount as well. And then um, I know that there are a couple of additional items that you are considering adding to the ordinance that I just want to say that I want to express my support for. Um, as you may know, uh, Supervisor Campos, Supervisor Avalos, and myself have also introduced potential, a potential ordinance to put on the ballot for the June election, um, just in case uh, we do need to uh, bring this to the voters. And many of the concepts that I know the, con uh, the commissioner are considering are ones that were already in the ordinance that we had introduced. One was, of course, um, delaying any disimbursement of public funds until a week after filing date. Um, there are many concerns about people running, applying, qualifying for public financing, and then realizing when they saw the pool of candidates they're running in that they didn't actually really want to continue running, but felt compelled to continue because they had already received public financing. So we felt that this would address that. We also thought it was important to um, bring in advance the filing date um, to June, potentially after the primaries. Um, I think many serious candidates um, sh can and should announce earlier just to get a real sense of what, what the field looks like um, for um, candidates who are considering office. Also, increasing the qualification for incumbents is something that we support. So raising it by 50%, uh, whether it's $15,000 or $75,000 for the mayor, $15,000 for Board of Suits, $75,000 for the mayor, we think is reasonable. If you're an incumbent, you should be able to raise that, that dollar amount in order to qualify for public financing. We also agreed with taking out the 4 to 1 and keeping it either 2 to 1 or 1 to 1. I know that that was a criticism that was um, leveled by the public, and I think that that's completely reasonable. And so that's something else that we support. Um, another um, another 
But another point of feedback that we heard was that um, the Board of Supervisors is only considering increasing the Board's suit ceiling and not the Mayor's um, ceiling, and that, that may look self-interested on our part because none of us are the Mayor of San Francisco. Um, I am certainly open to raising the ceiling for the mayoral race. Um, it's something that I kind of leave to the discretion of the Ethics Commission because I think you can look at the data in terms of what has been spent and what is reasonable. Um, of course, over time, I assume that the Ethics Commission would consider raising anyway um, as cost of campaigning goes up over time. Uh, I think that covers most of what um, Mr. St. Croix has already um, addressed. Just wanted you to know that um, many of the advocates have been working on uh, on the different offices, I'm getting a sense of what people would support if this ordinance came back to the Board of Supervisors. I know that um, several supervisors have, have also been in contact with Mr. St. Croix and also our office in terms of what they'd like to see. Um, you know, we're really hoping that we can get this out of the Ethics Commission and of course the Board of Supervisors so that we can um, respond to the fix um, necessary to be constitutional under the ruling. Thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, more than happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. President Kennedy. And thank you for working with our staff uh, and with your colleagues to try to uh, fashion a, a, a credible and effective solution to, to, this, to this issue. We appreciate that. No, we appreciate all of your input as well. A lot of the ideas that we heard from the commission has been really helpful in helping us strengthen public financing um, as an ordinance here in the city. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Supervisor Tim while we have her? Thank you, Supervisor Kim, for pulling this together. And I do think we need to respond to the constitutional aspects um, for a fix here. I did have one question since you raised it on the on the raising the feelings of the mayoral candidates. I think at our December meeting, we, we were inclined to do that, um, perhaps, but maybe not as high as, for example, on the expenditure ceiling, not go as high as 1975. Do you have any thoughts on if we went to 175? Would that be more? Would that be agreeable to the board? Or you know, I, I can't speak for all of my colleagues. For myself, you know, this wasn't one of the primary driving issues for right. for me. I think that what we saw in the last mayoral race was that um, the, the current ceiling worked for at least this year. I, I think every year, of course, the cost mm -hmm. of, of campaigning does increase. Right, and so I, I think that an increase is necessary in the next four years, the same year as when the next mayor's race is up. So um, I'm certainly open to a lower ceiling for the mayor's race. So if that number is, is amenable, at least with myself personally, I can't speak for all the members of my board. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, let's take public comment on this matter. For Good evening again, Commissioners. I'm Thomas McGraw. You know, I appreciate Supervisor Kim's um, proposed legislation uh, in attempting to make it uh, more in compliant with the Bennett decision. Um, although I, I would oppose any um, increases in cap amounts for supervisor or mayor elections. I don't think there's any data showing why the present caps are not adequate for any individual someone like for either supervisor or uh, mayor. Um, as you know, uh, the public financing comes out of the general fund and we have another $300 million uh, deficit this year at least. Um, I think that will need uh, could be spent uh, more appropriately. So I'm, I'm against uh, increasing the cap on public financing for supervisors or mayors um, because you have no data showing why the present cap is not adequate. Thank you. Some changes. Um, the, I think that the 
the raising the caps is appropriate, uh, in, both in the here and now and into the future. And talking to some of the members of the board, uh, you know, they, they actually, uh, without using names, one particular individual thought the 1.975 million was perhaps too low. Uh, you, you know, uh, you have to keep in mind that these are supervisors and some who may be thinking about their own mayor elections in the future. Um, and so, uh, you know, and also it, 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 a lot of it depends, of course, on whether you have a hard cap or you have the adjustable cap. Uh, and so I think that the adjustable cap is also an issue for some of the members of the board that, uh, you know, they, or the hard cap is, is something that they, they don't prefer. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a tough call because you do have public perception issues, as the previous um, speaker just said, about how much is too much given the, the uh, current climate. There's also the issue that isn't raised in the memo that uh, I, I think there, it is legally at risk uh, to have an adjustable cap of any kind. If you read the Supreme Court ruling um, in, in uh, the Bennett case, it didn't didn't say that it was because of the public financing aspect. It was, it was the fact that, that uh, a privately financed candidate's spending was hinged in some way to a publicly financed candidate, and that it would create a chilling effect by making them think, well, if I spend more money, this candidate is going to be able to get more money, whether it's public or private. Um, so I, I think that that's an issue that uh, you, you definitely want to give some thought to. It may, it may not be a reason to not do it because, um, you know, we need eight votes at the Board of Supervisors. And I think it actually is good public policy to have that adjustable cap if we can get away with it. And it also allows you to track independent expenditures, which is also uh, a valuable service to, to the community. The one uh, number quibble I would raise is if you look on page four and five of the memo, when you add up the numbers at the bottom, the uh, the incumbents actually end up getting more, $5,000 more in public and private money than the uh, non-incumbents, and the same for the mayor's race on page five, there's $25,000 more. You, you can just easily adjust these numbers, so in, in the public finance raised by incumbents in that column for one-to-one -one match of $35,000, if you change that to $32,500, and then the match would be $32,500, then the column at the bottom will add, add up exactly to $250,000. And the same in the mayor's race um, in the one to one instead of 275,000. If you lower that to 262,500 with a match of 262,500, it will exactly equal to 1.975 million that the non incumbents receive. I think just from a perception problem, it looks a little odd if the incumbents are, are allowed to have more money than the non incumbents. And why go there if you don't need to just adjust the numbers a little bit to make those add up? Thank you. Thank you. David Kopel, I've um, got a number of things to say. Let me um, try to speed through this. Um, I'm certainly supportive of making changes to the program along the lines of what we've uh, discussed in the past, including the uh, interested persons meeting. There are things that I like uh, generally about the legislation, and there are, there are things that I'm a bit concerned about. I've actually started in reverse with the Section 2 that proposes uh, changes to the Municipal Elections Code. Um, although not within the jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission, seems to me to um, violate the single subject rule of an ordinance, and I would suggest that that be divided into a separate file. It does have impact on uh, the program as relates to the um, deadline for filing nomination papers, moving that from E-88 to E-146 as uh, almost two months, 58 days uh, earlier filing. And I would note that that's uh, proposed, as I read it, um, would affect not just candidates for the mayor and board of soups, but all uh, elective offices in the city, including school board, college board, treasurer, etc. So on the rest of the legislation, starting on page three of the legislation, um, I certainly support the 10,000 100 contributors. Um, I would not necessarily leave it at D minus 70, as I've testified before. And again, this relates to the, the deadline for filing nomination papers. I would try to move that to E minus 60 so that it gives um, somewhat more time. But again, that depends on the filing deadline. Um, I have no. Excuse me, could you say more time, which way were you? 
the, the idea there is that if the deadline is E minus 88 to file nomination papers as it is now, so someone can file um, until the beginning of August, the E minus 70 deadline to get sufficient uh, qualified contributions from X number of contributors might be as short as 18 days if they file at the last minute. And there have been instances of that recently. So my thought was if the filing deadline remains at E minus 88, that giving it to E minus 60 or 28 days to gather sufficient contributions in uh, number and value would offer a more level playing field to the extent that that whole deadline is moved back by 58 days. That changes the whole thing, and I'll have to think about how that works. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank
from office simply for a campaign violation while in office as opposed to a, a candidate running who's not attained office. So that's an interesting um, construction, but maybe I'm, I don't know if I'm reading it correctly.
sorry, I was not aware though that um, there would be a difference though. I thought we could, there would be a way to work out the numbers so that it would still only hit the $250,000 ceiling. Um, might add some complications for incumbents to have that additional $5,000 in their account that they can't spend um, unless we approve a soft cap um, for our races. So, I mean, that's a point that I think we're very open to. But it was more to address the concern around um, uh, supervisors being to be able to vote on an ordinance that technically benefit us. So, so at least based on your understanding, you, you don't think it would be a significant issue if we adjusted the numbers such that the uh, the amount raised for a non-incumbent and incumbent were, were at two fifty. Yes, I think that that would be for me something I would like to see. However, I'm not sure if the numbers work out. Um, and my apologies for not looking more into the, the mechanisms of the two to one. I don't know how that, that impacted the final dollar amount in a campaign account. Um, I have a question. Um, your, your description is helpful. And it makes me wonder whether there's anything in the opposite direction where this becomes a benefit for incumbents. Um, and what I'm picturing is a real conversation on the ground in which somebody seeking contributions from others says, as they do now, I need your help. Would you please give me a contribution so that I can qualify? And if they have to raise more in order to do that, does that give them a kind of leverage? Or it, admittedly, it's a responsibility. You have to have the people you can ask. You have to be able to mm -hmm. secure it. But it also is, I can't think of any word more technical than it, it's still no, I some of your questions. Yeah, I have to raise $15,000. I have to raise $75,000. Can you help me exactly. achieve that goal? I would be shocked if any of my colleagues did not raise significantly more than that dollar amount or did not feel compelled to raise significantly more. So my, my assumption even for myself is that I would feel very compelled to raise a, a certain dollar amount that is much higher than $15,000 for a relay campaign. So I'm not sure if my ask would be more urgent. Mm -hmm. Um, just to qualify. I tend to agree with that sentiment. I mean, it's at the, the, the lowest threshold and it seems as a practical matter no incumbent could really hope to succeed. Right. I, yeah, if you take me back to the supervisor numbers, those are right. pretty basic. And, and if it helps us keep the number relatively low for the access number, non For the Yeah. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Hill, if I could, we could ask you a question again. Uh, you, you had some suggestion for making the, the numbers add up in a equal way. Can you reiterate the Yeah. So, um, for the board, if you look at the chart of the uh, numbers on the bottom of page four, right? There's a one the where you get to the one to one mm -hmm. um, under the part for public funds raised by incumbents, which is really private funds. So fix that type of um, where it says thirty-five thousand. If you lower that to thirty-two thousand five hundred, and then the matching public funds would be thirty-two thousand five hundred, then the total would equal two hundred and fifty thousand. Just to get into five thousand dollars. So essentially, in that scenario, a public, uh, an incumbent candidate who accepted public financing would, would, would only be able to obtain a maximum of one fifty to five hundred. Right. That's right. Just a bookkeeping thing. I mean, it's not, uh, and then for, for the mayor's race, um, using your current numbers here, same uh, column one to one. If you lower the two hundred seventy-five thousand to two hundred sixty-two thousand five hundred, um, and uh, both for the public, the public private funds raised by incumbents and public matching funds, then it, it brings it down to the same amount. And then the uh, overall public 
matching public funds would be 1.2.
use of the Benaki Amendment proposal as it is, um, similar over the board and the board can use its process to determine which of those two proposals they prefer. Okay. And our discussion was indicates which one we prefer. Right. If they that they can take they can take it. In my view on it, it's part influenced by the soft ceiling. I, I would understand in a hard cap situation that the concern much is much stronger that you need to set a limit that is actually realistic. Uh, you know, in a soft cap situation, even if the the, the the total, even if the cap, the soft cap is a little bit turns out to be a little bit low eight years from now, a candidate could still compete by raising private funds. But uh, Mr. Shen. Uh, just one suggestion, really. Um, just as a matter of procedure, you could approve two versions of the ordinance at a tonight's meeting. Uh, but at a quick sidebar, I have Mr. Wester Kim. Um, she expressed a strong preference for a single option coming out of tonight's meeting. Um, that it would just be, you know, obviously after this proposal makes it out of tonight's meeting, if something does make it out, it really is on her office and some of her colleagues to really move it forward in the process. I think as a practical matter, it's easier one option or one proposal as opposed to multiple proposal. And, and that's that's true even if the proposal is not identical to what has been proposed here. That's sort of short. Sorry we're bringing me up here multiple times. No 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 I, that's why I'm here. Uh, and I appreciate I appreciate the, the discussion, the dialogue. I, it is my preference that we get one ordinance back to the board of supervisors. And I think around the mayoral ceiling, I think we really look at the expertise of the ethics commission to kind of help determine that number. So whether it's 1.7, 1.9, I, I think that there's a level of deference that um, my colleagues will have in terms of that final number coming before us. Yeah, I, there's, you know, I think there's some disagreement, but not a very strong disagreement about the hard versus soft cap. I've generally heard slightly more support for the soft cap. I would like to discuss the soft cap a little bit. Um, and you said everything you said about why you think the soft cap is um, a better um, approach and that's what you're yeah, my, my reading of the ruling was that the Supreme Court was very specific that it was the trigger of the public funds disbursement um, that that burdened, substantially burdened the First Amendment rights of an independent expenditure. I, I know that because there wasn't a specific ruling to that particular issue, it's hard for us to say. And I know we have several attorneys on the commission, so I, I'm sure that you have your opinions as well. Uh, I think that the general feeling is that a soft cap is more fair. Um, if, if, if there's an independent party that decides to throw in an inordinate amount of funding um, opposing your candidacy, I, I think it's only fair that you should be able to privately raise dollars. I, I think it's very different from the other public financing schemes that we've looked at. Um, it doesn't involve any public funding disbursement, and, and so I think that's why there's a slight preference for that dollar amount. You know, we partially address that with raising the ceiling. You know, I, I counter some of the points that there isn't data to support that. I think in every race we had to raise the ceiling, and that that was we reached a number that we thought was fairly reasonable um, to kind of run a credible campaign that can get you actually a seat on the board of supervisors or in the mayor's office. Um, but I, I generally heard kind of a soft preference, just in case there's a kind of unlikely. Um, well, I don't want to call it unlikely. Just a scenario where you're really vastly being outspent. No race. There are two considerations that I have been important to our interest in having the system in the first place, and um, I wonder if you could speak to how you think they play out here. One is um, the governmental interest in participation in a publicly financed campaign system in the first place. Do you think that the soft versus hard cap will? Um, make it more likely that candidates uh, will feel comfortable or safe participating in mm -hmm. races down mm -hmm. I, I think definitely um, when you're looking at candidates that are considering what route they're going to go down, um, their ability to compete um, will play a factor in whether they decide to take public financing or not. And I know that you know much of 
kind of the practices or specifics that we put into this law was in order to encourage as many people as possible to participate in public financing. And I, I think we've really seen that too. And, and you know, every year there's kind of been an increase in the number of candidates that have participated in public financing, which in many ways I think has been important in, in, in quote unquote, you know, kind of creating similar budgets amongst a variety of different campaigns. And, and of course, allowing candidates to really spend time with voters at having run for office Fundraising takes up an inordinate amount of time when you're running and can really take away from the time that you can spend door knocking, doing visibility on the streets, and really interfacing with, with what voters would want to see. It certainly freed up my time, and I think I had a much stronger sense of what the district wanted and some of the goals and priorities that they have for the district because I was able to spend that time doing that groundwork. So you're saying that the, that's with respect to the soft cap, so the soft cap would give you the flexibility to run a more viable campaign as a publicly financed candidate? It would allow us to be competitive um, as a publicly financed candidate. Um, there would be no disincentive in being a part of the program that I think allows candidates to really be more part of the democratic process with voters. And so you think that it will, given your feelings about that other candidates would be likely to be hear from incumbents that this was effective and, worth and secure um, enough to be willing to participate in the public rights. I, I believe so. Thank you. No, thank you. Restrain <laughs> false um, yes. uh, limits on spending. So, in the absence of uh, a record that gives us some other number to work from, uh, 
that's the word. I would tell them the direction. The question I have is, is as we uh, approach the next mayoral election, are we able to revisit uh, the amount and change it, or then is it basically written in stone at that point until we make the official changes after the election? We, as we are working on today, we, we are free to go back and change the ordinance, but um, as always, you need a supermajority of both the ethics commission and the board. So these changes are um, so always going to be very difficult. So not a central matter. Uh, this would be still sticking with the soft cat, right? I mean, that's, that would make more sense to me. We did the lower amount, especially. Likewise, I mean, I think there are there are concerns, constitutional concerns about soft cap, but I think uh, sort of in light of what the decision says and, and, and where the precedents have come out to date, to me that's a risk worth taking. Uh, and what about the issue of equalizing the amounts for public for incumbents and non-incumbents? Are we in agreement that that should, the numbers should work out so that an incumbent would earn $2,500 less, have a $2,500 lower ceiling on public, publicly available funds uh, so that um, the total amounts that they could spend would be the same and there wouldn't be any campaign surplus to deal with the city of no expenditure cap. Raise. Okay, so then um, is there a motion to amend the uh, CPRO as proposed subject to following changes? Um, adjusting the for an incumbent for the poor supervisor's race, there would be an adjustment in the uh, matching funds uh, to one hundred fifty thousand five hundred, and an adjustment to the one-to-one -one match from thirty-five thousand to thirty-two thousand five hundred, uh, whereby a, an incumbent candidate and a non-incumbent candidate uh, would both be able to raise a maximum of two hundred fifty thousand dollars subject to the IECE ceiling being raised. Uh, with a further amendment that the uh, mayoral ceiling be similarly adjusted to uh, reflect a, a total cap of $1.75 million with the one-to-one -one ratio similarly adjusted such that the 1.75 million would apply both to an incumbent candidate and a non-incumbent candidate for mayor. So Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. You have something to say? Yes. Yeah, uh, just two points. Um, I think it should be made clear, and I'm not trying to, you know, influence the the vote here, but just to, to clarify, um, the, these, the two charts here don't take into account um, contributions that aren't matchable. So in practice, the total the theoretical match of 155000 never really gets achieved unless the, the IEC is raised and there's more matchable contributions, because you're always going to have, for instance, family from out of town and other out of town contributions, or things that, that aren't matchable. And some of the other proposals that were looked at uh, in November or December had a line for private funds not subject to match. These charts don't. So I think we all understand that okay. this would be only matching funds. And theoretical. And the, the other question that I had, if you're going to the 1.75 on the mail race, what amount is the public funds 
cap that's now 1.225, what would that go to? I think that's important for you to make clear. And I have not the map that Mr. Hill has suggested. I think that goes to 1.075, but again, I mean, I would leave it to the staff to, to make a corresponding reduction based on the, the, uh, the devotion. They'll figure it out, I'm told. Okay, thank you. Okay, the motion was uh, seconded, just so the record is clear. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None opposed. It passes. Zero. Thank you for all of you who came and uh, provided valuable input. And again, we thank uh, the staff and, and supervisors and all those who participated. I think this was a helpful process that we engaged in pretty quickly. And Godspeed. <laughs>
that we're not getting everything done, but we're not getting nothing done. Um, I think that would help. The, the memo doesn't detail the existing staff and non-staff costs. And actually, if you're um, having to produce a contingency cut, I would immediately offer uh, televising the meetings as, as being something to offer up. I continue to think that it's a bad idea and waste of funds, much as I love SFGTV. But um, as we've seen tonight, everyone's gone. Oh, we have no idea the scope of the audience. Thousands are, are watching. In fact, people come up to me every day and say, I see you on TV. And I think that's unfortunate. Thank you. Perception. Yes, thank you. Uh, comments or questions from the commission on the budget request? These are tough times. But I, I think it's a reasonable balance of the um, independence of the commission and uh, respect for the city's budget situation. Is there a motion to approve the budget request? So Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 4 0. Uh, minutes from the commission's December 11, 2011 meeting. Public comment? David Kopel. It was actually the meeting of December 12th, so that is correct on the draft minutes, but not on the agenda. Um, I can mark up the minutes if you'd like. There are a couple of instances of other uh, typos. Page 5, decision 26. I think that should be Executive Director St. Croix. There were some other instances that could be made slightly more clear. Um, the attached 150-word uh, statements, I think that's fine, but I would suggest adding what agenda item each statement was in relation to, because there were several from an individual that don't track easily, so just indicate that that was submitted in connection with item whatever. Um, and finally, the closed session doesn't have the uh, detail that's required under the Sunshine Ordinance um, as to who is present in closed session. So that, could, that too could be added. Again, I can mark it up and give it to the staff, but they're really just minor. I agree with Mr. Popel's suggestion that the um, statements from people who present to us um, would be clearer if they just indicated the Roman
assume that there's no yeah, problem confidentiality. identifying people, but I want to make sure before we sure yeah. there is a confidential clue up here at public in, in private session. Is it a case that if it's a probable cause situation and we find that there's a non probable cause that the person wants to that we have an obligation to have the I can just summarize by saying that the Sunshine Ordinance provides that those present in closed session need to be identified except where their identification would interfere with other things. So you may rewrite that to say it was the members, the president, the staff, the city attorney, and an unidentified Probably individual or, or something, but just some language about who is present. That will work. But I'll leave that to staff discretion to sort out. Of yeah, I mean, for legal advice, then you can express what I understand. Like, the cause of Yes. Thank you. It, uh, so is there a so subject to all of that? Uh, Mr. Sutton's made a motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Motion passes. The executive director's report. Just one highlight. Um, we do want to try to have a our joint meeting with Sunshine Ordinance Task Force in February. So I'll be asking you to put your calendars with um, suggested dates. Um, and I <coughs> anticipate this being um, either a daytime meeting or a meeting early in the evening starting at 4 or 5 o'clock, um, something like that. Um, um, but we first have to identify um, the dates that rooms are ready available and the dates that commissioners and members of the Sunshine Task Force. So it's going to take a little bit of time, but uh, we, now that we are in the new year, we stand on the bed on that point. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item on the agenda, uh, public comments. items on page three of the staff's of legislative uh, proposals. The common legislation that was referred to earlier, since that has not yet had a hearing or finally <coughs> been scheduled, that won't be able to take effect prior to the February deadline when candidates could, under current law, apply for it and be certified for public financing. Does the staff have an intention or need direction about how to proceed um, in the event that a candidate does raise funds and seek certification while that legislation is pending because in theory they would be subject to the current law and current rules. That was kind of an open question. Um, I suppose it depends in part on when that redistricting task force gets its work done. But anyway.